Hi, my name's Alyssa. Thanks for watching today. Before we get started, we wanted to fill you in on our church. Here at Grace, we have a mission and a purpose. Our goal is to help people discover truth, decide on Jesus, demonstrate change, and deploy for others. If you're looking for a church, we would love for you to come be a part of what God is doing here at Grace. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We would also like to invite you to one of our Sunday morning services. Check out ohiograce.com for a list of campuses and service times in your area. We have a great time gathering for music, hanging out, and learning about who God is and how that affects our lives. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace. Now, I don't want to waste any time. I want to start this morning off with a moment of just self-evaluation. I want all of us, and I would even challenge if you can, write it down on a uh, connect card or a bulletin or text yourself, do something. But think of one thing in your life, or maybe for some of you it's the thing. What is one thing in, you, in your life that you wish could be different? There's a problem. <laughs> I maybe heard some chuckles like, oh, I got a lot. Maybe it's a relationship that's strained. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's an illness for you or a friend or a family member. Maybe it's the fact that uh, you and your husband, you and your wife can't have kids and you feel like that's what God would want you to do. And what is one thing that seems like a problem that just won't go away? And I want us to kind of refer back to that um, as we go through this message, because I'm sure that's what the family here of Lazarus is thinking in John chapter 11, and, and uh, we're in the series, the book of John, and last week, AJ talked about uh, part of chapter 10, where it is the life and ministry of Jesus, and we continue to see different responses to Jesus. After he taught, he said, I am the, uh, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd, uh, that only salvation comes to me, or through me, and people reacted to that differently. Some of them were like, this guy is insane, he is nuts, he is demon-possessed, don't listen to him. And others were thinking, okay, well, I don't think a demon would be teaching and doing the good things that he's doing. Like, that doesn't make any sense. There's all these different responses. And then the religious Jews, and these aren't Christians, these are the people that thought that you could get to God by obeying the law, they kept pressing Jesus and they were tired of the runaround, and they know Jesus teaches in stories and metaphors. And they go to him and say, all right, we're tired of the games. Are you the Messiah? Tell us plainly. And here's what they say in John chapter 10, verse 25 through 30. Uh, it says, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, those verses alone deserve an entire sermon, uh, but we're going to summarize them real quick. He says, I've already told you. And you don't believe me. As the good shepherd, my sheep or my followers, they recognize me as the Messiah. And I will never lose them. They won't get lost. They won't perish. Not because they're such good sheep. Like as Christians, we don't lose our salvation just because, or, or our salvation isn't secure just because I try hard and I don't sin that much. We are secure because we have a good shepherd. And my great father, Jesus says, He's not going to lose them either because the salvation we offer is secure. I and the Father are one. And naturally, this is when they lose their minds. They're like, this guy is a man, but he claims to be God. That's blasphemy. So they try to stone him on the spot. 
And then about a minute later, when they didn't do that, they tried to arrest him. Jesus eventually gets away, but he escapes and heads a little northeast across the Jordan River. And that's where we pick up our story today in John chapter 11. That it's a story that, like AJ was saying, a lot of us are probably familiar with. And a message, John chapter 11, a message was sent to Jesus about a family that he loves. And he finds out that family is in trouble. And uh, Lazarus, who has a sister, Mary and Martha, is sick. And this isn't just like, a, oh, he'll get over it kind of sick. Okay, two weeks ago, my wife and I both had COVID. And I know it's affected a lot of people differently, but we were thankfully able to kind of, about a week and a half, um, get back to normal, get a negative and go back to work and things like that. And it's actually the fifth time I had COVID. And so my immune system treats it like an old friend, like, oh, it's been a few months, come on in. And I'm working on it, I don't know what to do. But, uh, but we were able to move on, like, it's not a quick illness, he's sick for a little bit, it's not, it's not even a cold, this is a life-threatening illness. And so the messenger travels to where Jesus was at from Bethany, the city that Lazarus is in, to give him a message because the family didn't know what to do, so they reach out to Jesus knowing that he could help. And the messenger comes to Jesus and says, Lord, the one you love is sick. And verse 4 says this. It says, when Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, we all probably know the story. Lazarus ends up dying a few verses later. But Jesus says, okay, it's not going to end in death. How does that make sense? Because not only will Lazarus die, when we kind of figure out the timing of when he was buried and all these things, it's likely that he was even dead before the messenger got to Jesus. And so what is Jesus talking about there? And then it, it gets seemingly worse. Verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. It says he stayed two more days. And if he loved Lazarus so much... Why would he do that? And you can tell how close they are because there's no specific request. The message was simply, Lazarus is sick. Not, hey, Jesus, Lazarus, you remember us from Bethany, and you should probably come, and if you can't heal him, at least comfort him and the sisters and the family. Like, nothing specific. They knew how close they were. They were confident that he would help in time of need. In time of need. It's the same with, with us, that if you find out that your, one of your best friends is in the hospital and this could be the end of their life, you are expected to what? To, to move. Because of the severity of the situation, you are going to be there. You go. And it's almost kind of jarring to read Jesus to where it seems like there's no urgency. It seems insensitive. Like, who does that? But what I don't want us to miss is verse 5 where it says Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. John makes the point of that. He's told us twice already that he loves them. So whatever he's doing in waiting two days, it's not thoughtless, it's not mean, it's not selfish. There is a plan. And when he said that the sickness wouldn't end in death, he didn't mean that Lazarus wouldn't die at all. He means the end result of this specific sickness will not be death. Because again, Jesus has a plan. Instead, this sickness is for the glory of God. And this is where I want us to catch what's going on here. That all of the pain and all of the confusion that we're about to read from the family, from the disciples, from the people around, Jesus wants to use it for the glory of God. And so that's what we're going to see. But two, two days go by, sends the messenger away, and then he tells his disciples, hey, we got to go to Judea again. And that's the, the region where Jerusalem and Bethany are at. Jerusalem was where they were at in chapter 10, where Jesus was almost stoned and arrested. And uh, 
He tells the disciples, hey, we have to go back. And they're like reasoning with them. Jesus, do you really want to go back? Do you not remember chapter 10 where they tried to kill you and then they uh, tried to arrest you the next minute? Like we barely got away. And he basically tells them, like, hey, the, the time is short. We have to do the work of God. And so the disciples are like, all right, all right well, if we're going to die, we're going to die, but, but we're with you. And uh, what's the work? And he tells them, Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm on my way to wake him up. And I, I love the interactions between Jesus and the disciples because usually Jesus will say something, and then the disciples think that Jesus is missing something, but it's the other way around, right? And so he says he's asleep, got to go wake him up. And they're going, Jesus, he's sick. Like, he should be resting. This is a good thing. And then Jesus just, no, oh, not again. Okay, well, here's actually what's, what's going on. And he tells them plainly. He says, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. See, we're not told what the disciples' faith was specifically, but Jesus already alludes to what he's going to use this situation for, to help them believe, to give them greater faith. They still don't get the full picture. So Jesus, he begins traveling, and let me kind of set the scene that he's walking into, because by the, by the time that he arrives in Bethany to see Lazarus, um, or to see his family, he has been dead and in the tomb for four days. And so by that time, a lot of people have come to comfort the family. It's probably packed in and around their house. And the grieving process, the custom, usually lasted around a month. Someone passed away the next month, which kind of committed to, to mourning them and that whole process. In the first three days, it was always the most intense. Like, obviously, it's, you know, just after the fact, so the family's still coping with it, and, um, you know, that, that makes sense. But the fourth day is generally when the friends of the, the person could come and give their condolences. Like, the first three was mainly for the family, then the friends could come on day four. And, again, that's when Jesus arrives. But this whole process, it would go on for weeks normally, but this process was normal for them, but they also took it serious. They would even hire professional mourners to come and be there at the home, at whatever services they were having, like, which is weird to us. Like, can you imagine today walking into a church or to a funeral home for a service and like, there's people in the corner clearly taking it hard and you're going, wow, they must have been really close. And, oh, no, I hired them. What? <laughs> like, yeah, I hired them. I, I figured kind of, you know, fill the room and set the energy. It's like, that's weird. But that's what they did. And it's foreign to us, but it was so common and almost necessary to them. And so the whole scene is sad, is grim, and a lot of people with no joy. And to make matters worse, they had a, a popular belief at that time, and this is not what the Bible teaches, so this is not true, but after someone died and they were buried, three days after they were buried, the spirit of that person would hover around the body. Just in case, like, oh, you never know, they might, uh, the spirit may re-enter and then they get back up. Uh, but on day four is when the spirit left, so they said. And so day four, for them, was solidifying their reality that their brother is gone. And this scene isn't just sad, it's hopeless. And Jesus shows up, but he is four days too late. Verse 20 through 24, we see his first interaction with one of the sisters. Martha, he heard that Jesus was coming. She went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said, I, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So Martha, you can tell she's, she's more pragmatic out of the two sisters. And, you know, she kind of puts on the brave face, goes outside to meet Jesus. And you can tell where her heart is at by the first thing she says. 
basically it's, why weren't you here? Like we wouldn't be in this situation if you would have showed up, if you would have been present. And isn't that usually what happens with a lot of us, right? When life hits or we're faced with death, questions begin to kind of fill in those blank spaces. And that's what they're doing. They're playing the shoulda, coulda, woulda game and, and what if. And they probably, during that time, Mary and Martha maybe looked at each other day after day going, man, what if Jesus were here? Like, wouldn't it just be better if, if this happened? And that's where her hearts are at. And she's not complaining to Jesus. She's disappointed. And Jesus gives her comfort to know that Lazarus will rise again. And she goes, yeah, I, I know in the end everything's going to be okay. And he's going, no, not some future, like he'll rise in the end times. Today he will rise. And she doesn't get it. And this is when Jesus gives her the fifth out of the seven I am statements in the book of John that Zach and Ajay have talked about the past few weeks. Jesus said to her, Verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. This is one of the clear like, gospel uh, passages in the book of John. That he says, if you believe in me, that is where life is found. And, uh, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He was claiming to be the source of both. That there is no resurrection without Jesus. There is no life without Jesus. And he doesn't just claim to give life. He says he is life. And it's one thing to say it, right? It's one thing to just claim to be it. But he is about ready to prove it. And he asked Martha, hey, do you believe this? And she goes, yeah, I, I do. I believe that you're the Messiah. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you, are, that you have come to this world for a reason. And that's great. She knows who Jesus is and, and there's faith there. But that faith doesn't seem to translate into her current situation. Because Jesus plainly told her, your brother will rise again. And she still didn't understand. She didn't believe that Jesus could help her now in this scenario. And she doesn't grasp everything, but Jesus wants to use this event for a greater purpose. And so after this conversation, uh, Martha goes and gets her sister. Uh, verse 32. It says, Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him. She fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. That's, it's that same response. She just doesn't have maybe the same poise as, as, uh, as Martha does. But Mary drops at Jesus' feet and says, if you would have been here. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you put him? Lord, they told him, come and see Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? See, it's, it's in that part that we have the shortest verse in the Bible. And so if you guys want to memorize a verse today, that's your best shot. That's, that's, we could probably get that one. But the book of John shows Jesus to be God, that he's holy, that he's perfect, that he is divine. But here we see emotion. We see that he feels. But why was he crying? Was it just because he was sad? Like, did he just miss Lazarus and wish that he was alive? Well, no, no that really doesn't make sense because we know what he's about to do, right? So what is it? And the words before it give us a clue. In verse 33, it says that he was deeply moved and troubled, deeply moved and troubled, uh, deeply moved, it just means to feel strongly. And then troubled, it means to be agitated or to be disturbed or stirred up. So he was strongly agitated. And this might conflict with what a lot of us think he was crying for, 
But it wasn't necessarily a sadness. It was more like an anger. And this distress, this anger finally comes out in tears as Jesus wept. But what's he upset about? In short, it's because this wasn't how it was supposed to be. When Jesus created the world, he said it was good. And now he's experiencing this, that the world is full of sin and death and grief and brokenness. And he's seeing the sadness of Mary, the, the pride and disbelief of people around who in a few days they're going to be wanting to crucify him. He's seeing the lack of faith in his followers, and people are even questioning whether or not he loves Lazarus. That's what they said. They said if, if he really loved him or was able to do something, he would have been there. And, and maybe that's uh, something, maybe that's that, that lie that we've told ourselves before. That if God really cared about me, he would have been there. If God actually knew what I was going through, if he was a good God, he wouldn't have let me go through what I went through. The Bible just says that's not true. That God sees the effects of sin in your life and in the world, and he feels for what you've gone through. He wants to use it, though, for a greater purpose. Jesus, he didn't weep for himself, he wept for others, and he wept for what breaks the heart of God. And so then, as that happens, they, they led Jesus to the tomb of Lazarus, and uh, verse 38 and 39 says, Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha the dead man's sister told him, Lord, there's already a stench. He has been dead four days. Now, this is just for your own personal knowledge. I didn't know this. Pastor Luke is speaking in Fremont at, at our campus on the same passage. And uh, he put me on to the, to the King James version of this verse. I didn't know it. But instead, we're reading the CSB. It says, like, Lord, there is a stench. He's been dead four days. The King James says... Uh, by this time, he stinketh. <laughs> and, and he told me that. I'm like, that's not in the Bible. He goes, yeah, it's in the Bible. So check it for yourselves. King James is there. But Martha, still not getting what Jesus meant when he said, Lazarus will rise again. She is asked to move the stone, and she's seeing this as a completely unreasonable request. Like, you don't want to do this. You're just going to make us relive this pain. It's going to stink. Like, Jesus, this is not a good idea. And so she hesitates. But sometimes I think God tells us to obey him even when it makes no sense, even when it may seem unusual. And it's to accomplish a greater purpose that he is going to remind her of as we see what Jesus does. Verse 40 to, uh, to 44. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you <clears throat> that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this, so that they may believe you sent me. So there's probably still a lot of people around. Maybe it's even noisy. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come out. The dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. The resurrection and the life backed up his claim and resurrected Lazarus from the dead. He shows himself to be legitimate, verifies who he is. In the book of John, there's seven signs that show that the, their whole purpose is meant to point to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is God. And this is number seven. This is the final one. The dead man, the Bible refers to him that way, the dead man walked out of the tomb, still wrapped, and after being dead for over a 100 hours, 
And in an instant, we don't know the initial response, but it probably turned from mourning to amazement. And many people around, again, there's a big crowd, a lot of them believed, said they turned to follow Jesus, but others didn't do that. They went and told the Pharisees or those religious leaders and kind of warned them of what Jesus was doing. Uh, Verse 47, 48 says, So the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was basically just like the Jewish leadership council. Okay, they were led by a high priest, and they made all the decisions. They did have a little bit of power. It says they got together. What are we going to do since this man is doing many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. They've had some run-ins with Jesus in the past, but they're like, we got to step it up. We need to do something before it gets out of hand. And as they're all flustered and as they're panicking, probably, trying to come up with plan A, plan B, they are, uh, someone, the high priest, stands up in the midst of it and says this. His name is Caiaphas, the high priest that year. He said, you know nothing at all. You're not considering that it is to your advantage that one man should die for the people rather than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, and this is John writing. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to unite the scattered children of God. So from that day on, they plotted to kill him. He stands up and says, listen, you guys are thinking about this all wrong. We just need to get rid of him. Instead of all of us, Instead of Rome coming for us and wiping us out, we just have to take one guy out. And if one man's death can save a nation, it's worth it. And, and this is what we see all over the Bible, is that whatever the enemy or whatever someone intends for evil, God is going to use it for good. And so John is writing this, and he's understanding kind of what God wants to do with it, or what God has done with it. And he's like, yeah, one man is going to die. And he will save a nation, but not just to keep the Jewish political power, to save a nation from their sins. And not just the Jewish people, but everyone all over the world to die for their sins, to be their substitute. And even in this terrible plan, God has a greater purpose. And so Jesus He wasn't in the room, but he realizes, okay, it's probably not the best to be here in the moment. So it says that he travels 25 miles north and uh, and hangs out there a little bit. John tells us at the end of of chapter 11 that the Passover, the celebration of when God uh, spared the Israelites when they were in Egypt from the 10th plague, that uh, festival was coming soon. And so Jesus made his way back to Jerusalem, but not before... Uh, stopping in Bethany to see a familiar family. John chapter 12, uh, the first three verses say this. say that six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them. Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of perfume pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So they wanted to honor Jesus with a meal. He's back in town. And we see their first response after the miracle. Again, some weeks, maybe a couple months have passed. But Martha is tirelessly serving. Lazarus, he's at the table. He's quiet, but he's near Jesus. And Mary stands out as she shows her love for Jesus. And she grabs a pound bottle of liquid perfume. And the Bible says this isn't cheap. Okay, this is, this is like high level, high brand, Gucci level liquid perfume. I don't know if they make perfume, but I'm guessing they do. Okay, this is like expensive. 300 denarii it was worth. A denarii was a day's wage. Imagine spending 
the money that you've made in 300 days on one bottle of perfume. That's a lot of money. And Mary takes it into the room, pours it on Jesus' feet, and then wipes his feet with her hair. And this extravagant act of worship, she's showing that Jesus is more valuable than anything. Even this perfume, but that he is worthy to be praised and serves him and shows gratitude and devotion. And this happens, and you can probably guess which one, but one of the disciples does not love her act. Uh, Verse 4 says, Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who John writes in, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. And so you can almost picture Judas here, like they're all at the table. Mary comes in with the perfume, and he's going, oh, wow, she's breaking out the good stuff today. Okay, this is awesome. And uh, he knows how valuable it is. And then she begins to pour it on his feet, and he's probably thinking, whoa, hold on, hold on. That is a waste. Like, what are you doing? You can probably picture his eyes getting big and, and speaking out loud and being, don't do that. We could sell it for 300 denarii, and then we could keep the, I mean, we could give the money to the poor. Like, what are we doing? But Jesus defends her and says that what she is doing is right, that this wasn't a waste, but it was worship. Verse 7 and 8, the last two verses we'll read. Jesus answered, Leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. He's saying this was right for her to do. You have plenty of time to give to the poor, to serve other people, but I only have a week left until my time is up. And we see Mary, who last chapter, going through the death of her brother, was discouraged beyond belief but now is responding in worship. And through the awful circumstances, God worked in her life to accomplish a greater purpose. And it says from there, uh, Jesus left Bethany, made his way to Jerusalem, which is where we're going to pick up next week. But, um, But doing that, knowing that he's still facing opposition, people want to kill him, and not only him, but... The, the leaders have also decided, hey, we're going to kill Lazarus because he's the reason that he is back to life. He's the reason that more people have turned to Jesus. So we got to stop their progress. If we can't kill Jesus, let's kill this guy. And that's where we pause for today. But I want to take the next few minutes and look at the story that, that we just went through. I want us to notice the pain, the confusion, the stress that people experienced in the story of Lazarus. I mean, think about the disciples. Like they were loyal, they, they traveled with Jesus, but the whole time they were fearful that, okay, we're probably going to die because they're going to come back and get us and it's not safe to be traveling here. And this whole time they had no idea what Jesus was up to. But they s- still went, but it was tough for them. Then you have Mary and Martha, two sisters caring for their a uh, sick brother from an illness that came way too soon in life, all the while probably looking out the window every day, hoping that Jesus would arrive and, and save the day. But it doesn't happen, and, and they're discouraged. Then they have to deal with not only his death, but the funeral plans, the burial, um, and just dealing with all the friends and family. And then you have Lazarus who he's the one painfully lying on his deathbed wondering where his great friend Jesus is. And not only that, but when Jesus resurrected him, he gets back to life and then people want to kill him. He's like, I can't catch a break. This is is not that fun. All these things are happening to these people and they're going through it thinking, what is going on? What is God doing? They have Jesus there with them and they still have no confidence that things can be turned around. They're saying, God, there's too much going on. What could you possibly do with this mess? Let me uh, give you an example. Uh, something that I know 
nothing about, and when I say nothing, I mean nothing, is uh, like computer coding. You guys know what I mean? Okay. Uh, I have a screenshot of an example. Uh, I can't articulate to you how little I know about what's going on on the screen right now. All right, I can pick some keywords. Okay, there's some lights and, and there's uh, uh, the values and obviously the serial print, sensor, loop, void. Uh, you know, it's, the, it, it's all there, right? I don't know what I'm saying. But <laughs> I look at this photo and I see no order. I can see kind of some familiarities and a little bit of structure, but I don't see any order. I don't see any purpose. I don't see how this can be used out of all these letters, numbers, and symbols, like it just doesn't make sense to me. I'm looking and going, how can this be put to use? And I think that's what a lot of us do with our problems in life. That we look at it from a perspective of not knowing how maybe it's gonna end, and we go, God, what are you gonna do with this mess in my life? Same way we look at this. But I may not know how to work all this coding out to bring it to a you know, greater purpose, But you know who would? The author and the creator of this code. You know, would you look at that? I know the guy. His name is Nick Hurst. He's our tech guy here at Tiffin. Does an awesome job. And God thankfully made his brain work different than mine. Okay? And he knows how this works. That he was not only able to write it, but he was able to put it into use so that it could be practiced, so that it could be um, valued and seen. And actually, this code was used for our 2021 Christmas service, and we have a photo of what it was used for. Some of you guys might remember the big snowflake drum that we had, and then we got Cole New Love on it. And uh, every time you hit a drum, not only would it light up, but it had a different like sound or tune or note like attached to it. Super cool, great aspect of our service. But this came from the mess of that code, or what I view it. I didn't understand it. But the author and creator of that code was able to use it and put it into practice so that it could be something uh, useful, something productive, something worthwhile. And I think it's very similar to when we look at our trials in life and what God wants to do with them. And so whatever it was earlier in the service when I kicked it off and said, what's that one thing that you're going yeah, this is just not working out for me. What is God doing? It's never going to happen. I, I don't know how this is going to turn out for, for good. We can look at that and just like I looked at that code, go, what is happening here? We can look at our problems and go, what is God doing? Like it almost seems hopeless. And sure, that kind of stuff can happen in the Bible, but in my life, probably not. That's what we see. That's what we think. But God, who is the creator and author of life, is able to use it and bring it together in a way that can accomplish his greater purpose. And what is that greater purpose? It is the glory of God. That's what verse 4 in chapter 11 tells us, that if God is valued and esteemed as he is worshipped by more of his creation, if that's the result of the pain and the struggles in life, Jesus is telling us that it's worth it, that it is part of a plan. And think about the story. From the pain and the death of Lazarus, from that situation alone, the disciples had greater faith. Mary responded with greater worship. Martha was able to experience firsthand that Jesus keeps his promises, that he is trustworthy. Other Jews were saved because of Lazarus dying, that salvation was able to come to people. And even this awful plot of them killing Jesus, and they will eventually succeed and do what they wanted to do, God was even able to use that terrible scheme, terrible plan, and flip it for his glory. Jesus was not lying when he said that this sickness is for the glory of God. And I think the problem usually with us and even myself is that the glory of God isn't our main goal. Like, yeah, we want to honor God in our life. And, yeah, we, we, we kind of believe he can do something. 
but I would rather just have that problem like removed, right? It's like, can I just not experience it and then we're all happy? Or, hey, can I just have this sin desire or this addiction like stripped away from me? That way I just don't have a, uh, you know, I, I don't want to do it anymore. Or maybe this person, this relationship, if they would just kind of get what they got coming to them, that way they'd know their place and everybody be, you know, right? Like, we just want it gone. But God has a different idea. And what if there is something better for you than being happy based off your circumstances? What if God could use those things, whatever it is, to reveal to you and people around you what is more important? And maybe you're sitting here thinking, um, because part of me was thinking it too, like, okay, Michael, that's fine and dandy, but the story that we read in the Bible, like, Jesus fixed their problem. They were sad their brother was gone. They, Jesus brought their brother back. Happy ending, great. But it's a valid point. But the miracle of resurrecting Lazarus, John says its purpose was to reveal and show and prove Jesus to be the Messiah. That their brother coming back was never meant to be the source of their contentment. It wasn't a permanent fix. That's why Jesus told Martha, hey, you don't need a resurrection from your brother. Say, I'm going to do that. But you need the resurrection and the life. They need Jesus. And he's trying to tell us, we don't just need an end to our problems. We need to experience our Savior while going through those. And I'm not going to pretend that I know what all of you are going through, even in our church family alone. This week specifically has been more pain and more loss than I've ever experienced, and I'm sure that's true in this room right now. But I do know that God is aware of your life, every detail, and he cares, and he loves you, and I think what he's asking us is that we would switch our perspective on our problems. It's not just a nuisance to your life that, okay, could we just move on from this? He wants to use it as an opportunity for his glory to be shown, for him to work. And some of you don't believe he can, but Jesus makes it clear in this story, and he doesn't promise us that he's going to fix it. Just because Lazarus rose from the dead doesn't mean that he's going to fix all of your problems, but he will remind you of how great and how gracious and how patient and how loving our God is. And so my uh, challenge or my homework today for, for all of us is as we reflect on that one thing, for all of it, it's probably different for all of us, what is that one thing that you wish could be different in your life, that one problem? I want us to pray about it today on your car ride home, uh, later tonight, find a time, pray that God would change your heart, pray that God would work in it, pray that God would um, just heal it and fix it. But also ask yourself, if God doesn't solve that problem, like if God doesn't take that thing away or solve this thing that, that won't leave your life, if he doesn't fix it, how can it still be used for God's glory? How can it still be used for God's glory? And then whatever the answer is, take a step to make that happen. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's... Um, removing something from your life. I, I don't know what it is, but take a step to glorify God, even if he doesn't fix that. Because if you remember when they were at the tomb, before he rose Lazarus from the dead, what did he ask them to do? He said, hey, r remove the stone. Martha's like, uh, why? You know, that just seems unreasonable. But I think not I think, I know God wants to show off his glory in every problem that is present in this room. But I do think that sometimes it requires obedience on our part to see that happen. And so God knows, he's aware, he's not promising an easy fix to your problems if you trust him. But he wants to use whatever situation you're going through for his glory and your growth. And I think that's what he wants to encourage us with this morning and challenge us. So if we could, let's go ahead and stand up, and I'm going to pray as we um, end our service here.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us all here this morning for safe travels, and I pray that the same would be true as we go home or go to work or go out to eat. Um, God, so many things, so many life issues and troubles and trials are here in this room this morning that I have no idea what's going on, but you do. I pray that you would remind us of how good you are, even though it may not seem like you're treating the situation good for us. I pray that you would make your glory our highest goal and achievement and purpose that with our life and with everything we do, we want to glorify you. So why should that not be true for even our problems? And I pray that we would just obey you, follow what your word says, and be centered on Jesus with everything. And when we do that, we're going to see you work. And I pray that you would challenge us um, in that way and pray that we would not run from our problems, but we would encounter them, confront them, and that you would bring healing um, in so many ways today, this week, this year, and um, as we just continue to, to love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace.